I'm Anthony Scaramucci. Welcome to the new Wall Street Week. Today, we follow in this show's great tradition by bringing you one of the greatest investors of all time. And I'm Gary Kaminsky. He is one of the smartest minds on Wall Street. And when he speaks or he tweets, we all listen. What makes him tick? And how did he go from such humble beginnings to where he is today? And how is he going to help you make your money work for you? Please welcome Carl Icahn. Carl, we are so, so thrilled to have you here, Gary and I. I mean, it's, a, it's you. a, you know, we were talking about you before you got here, but we think you're arguably the best investor that we've ever met. Well, and so, so, but I want to go way back to the beginning. I want to go back to Far Rockaway, and I want to go back to that rough and tumble, humble beginning, uh, and tell us a little bit about how you went from there to Princeton. Yeah, we were, I was the first one from my high school that was a pretty tough high school. It's closed now. And I grew up in uh, Bayswater, which is Far Rockaway, yeah. and uh, it was a pretty na tough neighborhood. But I liked the guys that came from reform school more than the sort of, there was sort of two, two groups, uh, middle class Jewish guys, and then you had these real tough kids. And I got friendly with them. And uh, so I, I was, uh, my parents never thought I'd amount to too much. My father and mother who had the first buck they ever made, not that they ever made much, but they came from the Depression. And they were good people and all, but they never took a trip. My mother worked some six days a week. You know, she, she taught Sunday school. My father was an interesting guy. He uh, was sort of an intellectual, and he wanted to be a Metropolitan Opera singer. He was obsessed with, with his voice, and he never quite made it. So he was frustrated. So he became a cantor in a temple, actually in Cedarhurst, where you lived, in Bethel. But here's the funny part of that story. He was a dogmatic atheist. So here he was a cantor singing in a temple, and he'd see, and then Yom Kippur even, he'd go out just because he really didn't like the people in the congregation. He'd go into his car that he hid a couple of blocks away and eat a ham sandwich, literally, during Yom Kippur. And then <laughs> he'd we, come back and sing all those things. put cheese on it or no? A little bit of cheese so, on the hand or no? Yeah, you know, I, I never found out because <laughs> I, yeah, I, it's amazing that I was not institutionalized with the way I grew up. <laughs> and my mother's a very, very strong personality. So they told me, look, it, it, the only way we're going to pay for your tuition is if you get into Yale, Harvard, or Princeton, which they figured they were pretty safe with because nobody ever applied from Far Rockaway. And I got in, well, and I actually got into Princeton and, and Yale. My mother would boast her friends, you know, she's a school teacher, look at my son, I got in. But they were really worried about spending the money. And in those days, sure. it was only 750 bucks for tuition and 750 for room and board. So my father, my father said, you know, son, I'm thinking about you, uh, and I'm not gonna go back on my word. I'd rather you go to Queens College, you know, because Queens was free, but if you insist on going to Princeton, we decided we'll pay the tuition. I said, great, thanks, Dad, I really appreciate it, but not the room and board. So I said, well, wait a minute, how do I live? How do I eat? He said, you're a smart kid. I've watched you. You'll figure it out. And I went down and talked my way into it. It was hard to get a job as a combative boy. You're along that beach. It was very hard. You had to know somebody. I didn't know anybody. But I talked my way into it. And I got a job at Malibu Beach Club. And at Malibu Beach Club, I didn't know much about it. But, you know, I was a hustler. And I go, and there were a lot of young guys that were doing well then. You know, they, well, those days, you're making 15 grand a year. They were all doing well. They were guys from Brooklyn. And they'd be there. And I was a good guy. I'd get them, hey, if they wanted booze, I'd get them booze, you know. They wanted to meet the girl across the way. I'd go over, let me introduce you. You know, I was, yep. a, you know, I was a fun kid. Anthony, Carl and I both were combative boys. Both we both lived each near other. each other, but and you had a better area. You kept really slightly, little, little bit slightly better. better. I'm certain but, but that it was a great way. bathing suit better than you. Absolutely. That, but yeah. it was, it was, it was, it was, I mean, Carl, that was an amazing way to, uh, when you think, uh, we'll get into investing later, but it was an amazing way <laughs> yeah. to see, to see how, if you thought outside the box, the way you handled uh, those people, I'm sure that there was some connectivity years later in terms of getting outside of what everybody else yeah, was doing. Yeah, no, I learned a lot. But, but the thing that I really did learn was they'd stay Saturday night and yeah. have this poker game. To yep. me, it was a huge game. Yep. You could lose a 1000 bucks or $1,500, you know. It was huge. And they liked me, so they'd say, hey, kid, hey, kid, come sit down, lose your tips, play yep. with us. So the first time I played with them, I lost all my money that I made that week because I didn't know how to play. So I went, 
I read three books on poker. You know the books about it. These guys never read a book on it in their lives. And it's all mathematics, it really is. After reading those three books, I was 10 times better than them. And they were drinking, and I wasn't, so that made me 30 <laughs> I mean, times it's better. It's a big lesson our viewers. You gotta read, you know, yep. SATs, prep, yep. You gotta poker. read and look into stuff and read. research and- um, Big lesson. And really wait until you hit something. And um, every week I'd win, I don't know, four or five hundred bucks, three hundred bucks. I, every, at the end of the summer, I had two grand. Two thousand, and that's when room and board was only seven fifty. And my grandfather upstairs, who lived upstairs, because my parents wanted to save money, so he would pay rent <laughs> to my father. And he said, look, he said, don't tell him you're making the money. That's what he told. Don't <laughs> tell him you're making the money. I'll hide it for you. So I give him the money. After four years, I had about 10000 saved, and I paid my room. And to this day, I'll never know why my father and mother never asked me where I got the money to pay. They never asked me once, where did you get the money for the room and board? They just didn't care, you know, whatever it was. But Should, when you're down there, did you, uh, did you fit in? Uh, were you part of the mix there? Yeah, you, you know, I've never been part of the mix of anything. So, okay, so I, you know, I'm always been, I, I tell you, I, I fit in more with the guys from the reform school kids, then I, I, I always some sort of, you know, when I got down to Wall Street, well, I went to medical school for a while, you don't need the whole background, but uh, but then I start going on the wards, and I'm a slight hypochondriac, not that bad, but after you start reading about each disease, you start thinking you have you it. You got every one of them. And then, and then I go down, and I'm in the tuberculosis ward, and you know, tuberculosis is really catching, I mean, it's very contagious. And, this guy, I'm hiding, you know, there's about 10 or 20 guys in this room, and this uh, resident, he somehow picks me out, you know, and he says, this, the guy's lying there and he's coughing. Little guy is coughing on this, on this bed, and he says, Icon, go over and give me a deferential diagnosis. So I try to be funny. I said, well, it says TB up there. What do I have to go over there for? <laughs> and he says, Icon, don't be funny. This is medicine. And I said, okay, so I start tapping the guy and he coughs all over me, and that's it. I said, that's it, I'm out of here. He says, you leave now, you're never coming back. I said, I'm never coming back, you don't have to tell me that. And I went down, downstairs, I made him give me every goddamn shot in the world. I knew what to give me, I insisted. I, they must give me 30 shots, you know, before, you know. Sure. And, and then I crossed town, I'll never forget, I walked across for 34th Street on 42nd Street, joined the Army. Wall Street Week. Carl, let's switch to the markets. The, the data has been lackluster, the growth is slowing, uh, yet the market seems to be continuing to go up. Uh, what are your thoughts on the markets? Are you worried here? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very concerned about the market. I think that you, you have a situation where this market keeps going up and up with zero interest rates, and that's what's really pushing it. And yet, a lot of the uh, economic news isn't all that good, and also, uh, uh, perhaps more importantly, earnings aren't good. So here you have a market trading at 17, 18 times multiples, the S&P, and you wouldn't buy a stock that trades at 18 times that you believe is going to have earnings go down so 3%. Is your, is your portfolio set up for a correction? Yeah, yeah, we, we're very hedged. How, we're how, extremely how, hedged. Well, you have these very significant long positions, so what do you hedge? You hedge on the index? Yeah, options? yeah, you're making a good point. It, it, it's, it's difficult to really do a great job hedging because we got these long positions. I, with Apple, you can't really hedge it that much, but I feel so secure with Apple, you know, maybe I hope I'm not gonna be wrong, that if it goes down, I just buy more, so I don't worry. But a lot of the companies, you're right, I hedge, and I tell you, there's ways to hedge, and this is where you do these derivatives, and it gets a little arcane, but what I really think is, that's you know, what's, even more dangerous than the actual stock market is the high yield market. In other words, the uh, yeah. the junk bond market. You see the junk bond market at a high. I think it's it's it's, it's, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff it's ridiculous. Jeff was on two high. weeks right, ago right. saying the same thing. Yeah, it's ridiculously high for a couple of reasons. I think the fall rates are going to go up in this market. Spreads are going to widen. Yeah. And the raw and people buy it. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. The public, the public. Well, they're chasing the yield. Well, I'm going to try to put stuff out to tell the public what they should be aware of. You know, I feel bad for them. They, they, they're buying the yield, and, and you, they're, so they really believe, so you see all these high yield funds, money keeps going into them, yeah. because you, you think, oh, 
the bonds are going to go up. When they start coming down, right. there's going to be a great run to the exits. And what, what is even worse is that even in 08, where, by the way, we made a lot of money doing just what I'm going to tell you I'm doing now, but in 08 even, you had a bit of a safety net because of the prop desks at banks. Today, with the Volcker rule, yep. Yep. you can't even make that investment. Absolutely. So there's, there's no catching it. When, when these guys and these funds Get start running... Out. And a lot of yeah. 401k money is in these high yield bonds. I, and, and it's all, sad. I mean, pension, pension funds, money. high yields shouldn't be at the level they're at. They, they, the, the high yield, uh, the high yield market, going at interest rates only three percent against treasury uh, above treasuries. The spread, this, the, the credit spread, is way too narrow. So they were called high yield bonds, junk bonds yeah, for a reason. reason. There's a lot of people, I think your point, Carl, is that the yeah. public doesn't understand when they're looking at it, rates at zero, when they think five and a quarter or five and a half but, for something that's a suspect credit. But, Gary, let's ask is, Carl a question yeah. for the average investor. Yeah. If you had to send a message to the average investor, what else are you worried about, Carl? The pension funds are underinvested? Yeah, but the, uh, the pension funds might be too invested, too, because if you see a market, these pension funds need 8% returns, 8.5%. Right, so, they're so they're running into the wrong stuff. No, but I mean, they're, under, they're undercapitalized. I, I mean, I mean they're undercapitalized, underinvested, but what if the market does really crash? I mean, people say it can't happen, and it's not going to happen. You're not going to have 08 again. I remember in 07, I was, I mean, it's very similar. It's like deja vu. I was, I was very concerned in 07. And the irony is, uh, the irony is that in 07, just like now, people all knew the housing bubble was going to burst, but everybody was thinking, well, wait. You, you yeah, feel 15 is an 08? Well, I'm not going to tell you it's going to be 08. What I, about I, 16? I'm not saying it's I, I, I can't predict year to year. I, I think anybody that does is a fool. You can't really right. okay. say, I'm, you know, I'm worried about next month or even next year. But you worry about the, the system. And what's going on? And here's, a, I mean, and then you say, well, what's going to really crash it like 08, you know? And, and I remember in 07, in four days in 08, we made a billion and a half bucks, right? Because we put on those credit spreads and we made it on a, a couple of hundred million sure. invested because we had those credit spreads on. And I think they're right there again. Are, are you and, hedging out the, the long portfolios by being short the junk market? Short the junk market is... What I do is arcane. It's an right. arcane way of doing it. But you do it. You put it on a credit rivets. spread. You right. do it. You buy CDS. Correct. You buy insurance in sure. a way, and it's a little complicated. It's not hard to do it, but it's very hard oh, to explain. How did you get into? When did you start thinking about not just being yeah. an investor? How you define activism? Yeah, you look at a company, and we we look at the beginning, and you'd study it, and again, you know, I'd spend five hours a night to two in the morning looking for companies. And you look at them and say, this company is amazingly cheap. It's got great assets. It was, it was easy to do with that. Great assets, but they're not making any money. And then you look and say, why don't you make money? And, and, and you'd start talking to guys that understood the company better than I did. You know, an analyst, he said, the reason, uh, Carl, is that it's not that it's not great and doesn't have a great name, great this. It's the guy that runs it's an idiot. And he just shouldn't be there. So I said, why can't we get rid of him? So they said, well, nobody, how are you going to get rid of them? There's no accountability in that company. Clubby board. Clubby board. They're all well, buddies. Well, there's been this criticism. Um, Larry Fink over at BlackRock put this, uh, put this letter to a lot of these uh, CEOs a couple weeks back, and he said that this type of thinking is too short-term in nature. But I think you disagree with that because no, it's, yeah, not, I, it's I, not short-term in nature, No, but, but, but I don't disagree with them fully. I, I, but I get into what I think where I disagree with Larry yeah, Fink. Yeah. I agree that there are activists that really aren't what I call a true activist. These are guys that Go do pump and dump. the definition of activism, yeah. that okay? Your well, version of the definition. I, I really think that the guys like us, call activists, quote, that we go into a company and we do well for every shareholder. Correct. We make money for all the shells by cleaning the company up and getting on the board or whatever reason and saying, you got to do this, this, and this. And you, if you're a smart guy, even the guys on the board sort of know what they should be doing. But hey, you got a guy in there, and that, that, I won't go into my metaphor for how these guys get there. There are some very, very good at CEOs. You've done a great but, job yeah, over the years explaining you got how those boards yeah, work. How that boards work. Yes, yes. Hey, you got, but yeah, I want to make it clear for this program anywhere that there are very good CEOs I respect greatly. 
I mean, Tim Cook's a great CEO. The people that are not defining activism the way you are. So, okay, the let me get back to The people that go into the companies for the short term. Yeah. What are they? Who are they? Let, let, me, let, me, yeah. let me say where I do agree with Larry Fink. That today, and it gets me angry, there are guys that go in and say, we're activists. And they got some money, they raise a little hell, they go out in the newspapers. You know, the good guys, you know, the guys, the charismatic guys that talk on some of these programs. Oh, X, Y, Z. We're there, and we want to see that company sold, and we ain't going to rest till it's sold. Stock jumps five points. They sell the stock. They sell the stock. Pump right. and dump. Right. And that's, to me, despicable. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and by the way, way, and then they do worse. And, yeah. Yeah. To me, worse. Then they say, Icon's buying it, which I'm never even in it. I yes. never got close. Yes. Icon's buying it. Right. And I hate telling, the, I hate telling uh, they call me up from all these programs and say, are you buying it? We hear you're buying it. And I don't like to say what I own, but now I yeah. say it. I like to think of things, Tony, like a no-brainers. When you really get in, involved in the market, Market's an art, not a science. And you build certain instincts, I think. Yeah. It's almost like a tennis player. You, you, you didn't ask Sampras, why did you go this way? How did you know the guy was going to hit it there? He can't tell you why. How does the open field runner, who's really great, run it down the field? Yeah. He said, how come you stopped there and turned yeah, the so other it's, way? It's instincts. You, you can find experience. certain deals where it hits you over the head. Well, you it said. Is, and and you, you do those. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, you do them. And part of it is that you know that if you can get, I mean, it, it sounds funny, but <laughs> the company you buy, well, in the old days, you knew that it had a certain asset. You know what the asset was? The CEO, because if you got rid of him, this, the stock is going to go much higher. Well, Cole, you mentioned uh, Tim Cook, so uh, you brought it up. You said Tim Cook is a good CEO, so I guess we should get that on the record. You're happy with Tim Cook right now. We are back with the legendary investor, Carl Icahn. Well, Cole, you mentioned uh, Tim Cook, so uh, you brought it up. You said Tim Cook is a good CEO, so I guess we should get that on the record. You're happy with Tim Cook right now. I think he's done the right well, thing. Well, not right now. When, when we first bought it two years ago. 2013, you called it a no-brainer. We you called it a no-brainer. No and, and we no went on Twitter and said it, and yeah. I very rarely do that. Yeah. And I met Tim Cook because at that time, there were guys calling me and saying, hey, we've got to get rid of this Tim Cook. Right. And I met him, and I said, this guy's great. I had dinner with him and Steve Jobs apartment. put him in the... I just, and you've got to learn to have a feel for guy, for, right. for people. Yep. I said, the guy's a great guy. So what was the, the gut, gut feel? And you met him, the gut feel, you just what? meet with the guy, and after you talk to him, this, he just, he, he, the way he came out talking to me at that dinner was, this guy, he lives this, he breathes it, Parts he's obsessed right with same it. Same way you are. Yeah, he, he, a little yeah. bit he like looks, me. Yeah. He looks at the Apple products the same thing. way you looked at the options book right. when yeah. you were running that options book. Yeah, and, and he, he breathes it. And after you meet with him, guy said, you're not going to find a better so, guy. So the stock, yeah. uh, uh, apologize for looking down. I want to get the actual yeah. numbers right. So when you first put that tweet out, 2013, the stock is up 96% since then. And we haven't sold a share, and in fact, bought more. Yeah. That's creating, way that's creating like, a lot of shareholder like right value. Now. You've tweeted yeah. out recently, yeah. you like it. I, I, I think, listen, I can't tell you when a stock is up a lot, even though it's going at such a low multiple. It's amazing right. how low. How, I mean, how do you justify it's probably the size? The, the market S &P. cap is probably hanging the multiple a little bit. A little yeah. bit, and, and how do you justify in the S&P going at 18 times earnings, yeah. losing 2% in earnings, negative. These guys are talking about, I forgot, 30% increase. Yeah, 200 and, billion in cash. And, 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 yeah, and, and, and it, but if you take the cash out, it's 11 times earnings. It's absurdity. And I think it's one of the, every 50 years you get a company like this yep. that has everything going for it. It's like the old horse. I remember Secretary went in the Belmont by 30 lengths. 73. 30 lengths. 73. Right? 73. 30 yeah. lengths. Yep. I, I went around and made, I, I bet in every little parlor on it, you know, two bucks, five bucks. But I, I tell you something, that, that this is like Secretary. Now, hey, can something happen? Yeah. I mean, look, this is not a, a game where you can't lose. But, and I'm not telling you Apple can't go down. 30 points either. I mean, it, it, you know, this so, has happened. Scott, you're just talking about since, since, that, listen, since, two, that, since 2013, it hasn't been a straight line up, but the company's Never delivered. Been, Are right. you happy right now with the mix of, uh, of capital allocation, the buyback, the growth? Well, I'd products? always like to see bigger buybacks. So there go, let's talk about Larry Fink yeah, there. Yeah. So there, he's wrong and he's right. There were certain companies that, that can't do buybacks, but nature where he's of the wrong. But nature of the business. But where he's wrong, or where people are wrong to criticize a buyback is, where you have a mediocre CEO. Hey, take Motorola. We were Motorola. Yeah. So Fink would have said, Icon's wrong to tell Zan to give back money. 
Xander went and lost eight billion bucks by right. building eighteen operating systems. So the shells better lose an eighteen Satellites, billion or taking the, the money out. Yeah. Take Navistar. We we're mm -hmm. on the board there. We were the, the the guy built this goddamn contraption, like the the crazy uncle in the garage building this contraption for seven eight years. He blew ten billion dollars to it, and I can't remember the exact number. So Fink would say, "Oh, but you got to let them invest the money." Well, certain CEOs shouldn't be allowed to invest money. They shouldn't be CEOs. So. He's wrong in saying, let's throw the baby so, out so, with the so, bathwater. So, so, so the answer, it sounds like what you think is, sometimes those that are just trying to do something in the short term, get the stock up, make an announcement, and then sell but the stock. Those are the active, so-called activists. But those he's that right get, about that. But those that, get, right those that take a seat on the board, uh, try to get the, the, the yeah. CEO and the other boards, the other directors to understand. Treat it like the, it's their own business. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly well, it's it's their own right. money. Call. It, 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 because the reason it works is because it's obvious, because the system is dysfunctional. You can't get rid of these guys, and a lot of these guys, the most important thing in a company is the CEO, by far. Oh, absolutely. There's nothing close. And, and while- Sets the culture and sets the leadership. And while I don't believe they should get 750 times what the, what the uh, average worker gets, I don't begrudge them that money if the stock goes way up. Yeah. Because if he gets the stock up, let him have some good money. But look what you have. You got this, this clubby system, and and you know what? A lot of them feel they can do what they want because of guys like Larry Fink, and I like Larry Fink, right. but because of these uh, of, of index funds that really support him. And, and Larry will say to me, oh, we really go both ways. But I can't remember one time, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe he'll show me, one time when they voted for us. Look, Larry built a great company, and he's a very smart guy, and I like him personally, but and I agree with him, by the way, on, on the short-termism. In fact, I think he's right. There should be a penalty. Right. There should be a tax penalty. And I would back him on any you know, reasonable thing he would say about it, but not about going in and saying, hey, don't ask companies to give back money. Certain companies can't have, don't have the ability to invest it. So, so Carl, we want to play a little word association <laughs> game with you. Okay. So we're going to say a word, and you just tell us what you think. So I want to start with the word energy. And what's your, what's your view there? Problem right now, I think it will turn around three years from now, four years, or maybe sooner. But right now, it may go worse before better. And that, I hope it doesn't, because we own a lot of big it. Big positions yeah. in it. Trait you most dislike in people. Yeah, a little, I think mendacity, the first word that comes to my head. What about a, what about a big regret? Any big regrets? As much apple as I bought, I should have bought more. <laughs> <laughs> from there to uh, Barack Obama. Yeah, well, this is, I mean, with Obama, I know this will surprise you because I was really against Obama, but I think some of the things he does is okay. I do think, you know, I, so now I'm on the opposite side again because everybody mm -hmm. in the Hamptons hates his guts. You know, you go to parties, <laughs> and I don't, I think he's, look, I wouldn't want to see right. him president again, Listen, but I don't think he's terrible. All right, all right, but you're, um, uh, what about your parents? How do you think your parents would react today? You're one of well, the most they saw some of the they saw some of my success, and they were they was my father was touching. I I still cry about it. Still makes me cry for some reason. But but you know, in the late seventies, I was doing very well, and he never ever asked me what I did or how I did it. And I go to Florida to see him and my mother, and he comes up, son, come here, come here, and he and he never said he takes a pad, he takes a yellow pad and a pencil, here, explain to me what you do, and I. Hugged him. I said, "You finally admit it." He said, "Yeah." Yeah. Wow. It's a beautiful. That story. was touching. But I want to personally thank you for the type of person you are and the role model that you've been to so many of us. Please welcome Carl Icahn. I had the investing career. Started. Well, then I got in with Jack Dreyfus on Wall Street. You know, it wasn't tough getting a job. I went to Princeton, had good marks, and uh, I was doing. I did great. It, it, so I started thinking I'm really smart. But why'd which, you go to Jack Dreyfus? Why'd you pick Wall Street? Well, I knew All somebody. You do. Well, I, you know, I didn't know what to do. And I started studying how you pick stocks. And it really hit me how great it was, you know, what you mm -hmm. did. I met a guy that was a security analyst. And he's showing me how to pick these was, stocks. Was it going back to the books? Was it reading things about the industry? or? Well, no, no. I just liked it. But that wasn't really it. But when I got into Wall Street, I had 12, 15,000, which right. was a lot saved, right. you know. I started investing it, and in 61, the market was hot. And you never really, I've learned, I learned a lot from that, because you'd never confuse a bull market with brains. 
And, and what, what I did was confuse it. And I'm buying all these stocks, I'm picking this, and I'm picking that, and I had a following of people would listen to me, oh, wow, well, you can, but everybody was making money, you don't realize that. And Jack Dreyfus would tell me, he'd come over, he'd sort of like me, he'd sit there with me once in a while, and, and he said, you're gonna lose every penny you have. I'm telling you, Carl, before you're through it, he said, I got this. I was up to about $70,000, which wow. was huge. A lot he of says, money back he says, you know what, when this is over, six months, a year, maybe less, he says, not only won't you have the 70, you'll be negative. Everything you ever had. And he was right. In three days in 62, they cleaned me out. I was, I was there. And I learned. i tell you what I learned from that experience. You didn't learn from him just giving you the advice. You had to go through the pain. You had to go through the pain. You have exactly. to go through it. The market is not a gambling casino. And too many people, in this type of market, too many people think it is. And especially now with low interest rates. So it's really a dangerous place today. How'd you build yourself back up, though, after the cleanup? Well, then had a few bucks left, very little, and I said I got to learn something. So I read a lot about puts and calls, and in those days, that was really the Wild West, the puts and calls. And you had all these option brokers, if you remember, sure. and they were fleecing everybody. So I was the honest broker, so to speak. I'd come in and tell everybody, so put out a midweek option report, and I'd stay up every night calling people that write in for my report. And I'd be calling them from Cal to California, and I had a big following in options. And I'd give them more than they thought they would get, which I couldn't believe. Here's a guy that I don't know from New York calling these, this wealthy guy, and he'll sell, sell 10 calls on this stock, and I'll do it for five grand. I'd get him six grand. The guy couldn't believe it, right? Then I'd get him more. And the put call brokers couldn't believe it because they all wanted to give your business back. They said, I know you can do it cheaper cost. And I built this thing up. By 68, I was making seven, eight hundred grand a year, which was uh, like today, 10 million, 20 million. Where did the drive come from? Like, where, where I, I always had it. You have to really have an obsessive nature and whatever it is you want to do. You want to be a great tennis player. You know, there are guys that are more talented maybe than McEnroe or something like that. Maybe his brother, they say, was more talented, but McEnroe worked at it. McEnroe loved it, I guess. He was obsessive. He worked all the time. I mean, if you think so about brains, any of these brains guys. brains is not enough. Talent's not enough. Talent's right? not it's enough. Drive, you gotta, right? you got to do both. Well, you had this great options business. And when did you start thinking about not just being yeah. an investor, but somebody who Well, I, I wasn't an investor. I, was, I had this big following. And so I got the money. I had an uncle that had some money. And I, by that time, had saved a couple of hundred grand. You could buy a seat for 400. Mm -hmm. He loaned me 200, so I had enough of that borrowing. I didn't go to borrow that, so we had 600. And the interesting thing, when we worked out the numbers, my, I never forget, my uncle's accountant said, you're crazy to do this. You're making yourself five, 600,000 a year, no matter how you do this, with the income you're gonna make from the commissions, but you got your own seat now. You gotta have accountants, you gotta have lawyers, you gotta have overhead. There's no way you can make a penny. And he told my uncle, he said to him, look, you want to loan him 200, you're not going to lose it. He's putting up, you know, his 200, and the way it's structured, you really won't lose. And I had, you know, I was paying my uncle a real good return on the money plus a piece of the company. But I did it anyway. I said, forget it. I'm going to have my own firm. I realized then, in those days, in 68, 69, these guys that did arbitrage, there were only a few German Jewish firms, literally, like Goldman Sachs and so that did this arbitrage. Loeb. De Loeb actually didn't do it that much. They did merger arbitrage, but I'm talking bona fide. I couldn't afford merger arbitrage. I couldn't afford to figure one company will take over another. That's what they did. But this stuff was sort of arcane. It was mathematical. You, you bought a convertible this bond. This the Gus Levy era of Goldman Gus Sachs. Levy did some of it. Goldman did it. And a few German, and you made a fortune from it because you didn't have to put up any real money. See, we cleared with low roads, actually. Mm -hmm. And all I had to do is put up like 10%, because I'm buying a convertible bond, and I'm shorting the stock. Right, exactly. Right? You can't lose, literally. I mean, I'm making it more simple than it is, but you really couldn't lose. So you keep building up that position with the hope that one day the market crashes. And if it crashes, the convertible bond that converts into the stock is now a bond. It doesn't go down as low and fast right. as the stock. Right. Right. And if the stock start. falls down, gets killed, you make a when fortune. You, when when I hit with it, a when number did you start of times. taking the outside money? That was, um, we, we had an option writers fund then. And we always did very well for everybody. The arbitrage thing was making me literally 
And I was the only guy that could put it together with options. So I shorted, it, go longer. You couldn't lose if it, if it went down, you made a lot. If it went up, you sort of broke even. But if I did options, I made a lot on the upside. So I gave up the option business. I gave it to my assistants. I had two guys went over with me. They had a little piece of the business those days. Mm -hmm. I, I said, you, you keep that. And they both were making a lot of income from it. It, it pays to be ethical. I found over my life, I had a code that I lived by. You could laugh, but I had my own code. And I had a following then What's too. What's the code? Tell us the code. Well, the code is what, one part of the code. I mean, there's a few things. But one part of the code to me, and I had it inculcated for some reason, that if somebody gives you money to manage, you owe them your fealty, meaning you owe them loyalty. And that's how we built the option business. I was giving them an extra thousand bucks. It's part well, of the trust. You know, they, 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 they're entrusting with you something dear to themselves. Yeah, but what it was happened in, in the history, so I had these two guys, they owned a piece of the firm. You know, I don't, I don't remember how much, maybe 20%, firm 25. And the reason they left me was they had the following and the options. We had all this. And it was maybe 72, you guys, you were too young. But, but anyway, in 72, the market was hot. You know, right. the same as it is today, new issues go crazy. And nifty all these, 50. The Nifty 50. 50. Yeah. Crazy the multiples. The Nifty 50 back in, in the 70s, right? In the 70s. Yeah. Yep. And these little companies were going out. There were firms that F.L. Solomon were very friendly with. I mean, there were a bunch of these firms making a fortune. My two guys were making great money. I mean, frankly, they wouldn't have made it if I weren't there. But they were doing much better than they ever thought they would do. You know, they were living in Queens. They moved out to a nice place in New Jersey, wherever the hell they moved. But the thing is, especially one of them, was pushing like hell to do underwritings. Because we could do an underwriting, you know, this little dinky company, get into the underwriting group, and we had this big following, and we would buy a lot and make all the- uh, Underwriting fees. Underwriting fees, which were huge. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and these guys would have really benefited. I said, I'm not doing it. Because I'd look at the company. So when you look at the company, you say, how the hell can you sell somebody a company that makes plumbing fixtures and give them 40 times earnings for it? Oh, well, you got to understand, they got a new fixture. I said, let me, you, let's look at the new fixture. Right. Let me talk to some guy that understands that. You talk to a guy that understood, I'm just giving you an example. Let me understand the, the new fixture. The guy laughing at you. This is ridiculous. Oh, but they say it's great. They say, forget it. So they, they well, one of them said, well, I'm leaving the firm then. I said, God bless you. Leave the firm. I got the stock back from the guy. Yeah. And I didn't do it for that reason. And then the other guy left eventually, so I owned the whole firm. You know, I've always found that after that, I know it sounds cynical, but you have a choice if, you, uh, if you're going into a business, you can have partners or you can have money. So somebody can give you money and take a little piece, other partner is gonna work for you. I always took the money. We'll be right We are back with the legendary investor, Carl Icahn. Take us through 70s, 80s, 90s. You're, you're, you're running money for outside people. You're making your own money. I was doing arbitrage and options, and we built a great record, I mean, then, and made millions of dollars. The CBOE opened up, if you remember. And for a while, it was perfect. It was great, because they didn't have puts. Once they started the puts and the computers came on, you couldn't make riskless money like I was making. And I didn't like that. I, I didn't like... Take, I never did merger arbitrage, very little. I mean, everybody did a little bit. So I was, I was looking for something else. It came to my attention that activism, or what, what you call it, call it whatever you want, raider activism, the, 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 I haven't changed. The name's changed because they, they, they now find out that what we've done is good for, uh, is good for everybody and you made billions for oh, things. So they tell, you, they tell you, oh, well, I can't change. I didn't change. They, cha they changed. They changed. So that, that criticized it. You look at a company, and we we looked at the beginning, and you'd study it. And again, you know, I'd spend five hours a night to two in the morning looking for companies. And you look at them and say, this company is amazingly cheap. It's got great assets. It was, it was easy to do with that. Great assets, but they're not making any money. And then you look and say, why don't you make money? And, and, and you'd start talking to guys that understood the company better than I did. You know, an analyst, he said, the reason a call is that it's not that it's not great and doesn't have a great name, great this. It's the guy that runs it's an idiot. And he just shouldn't be there. So I said, why can't we get rid of him? So they said, well, nobody, how are you going to get rid of him? There's no accountability in that company. Clubby board. Clubby board. They're all buddies. We make money for all the shells by cleaning the company up and getting on the board for whatever reason and saying, you got to do this, this, and this. And 
you, if you're a smart guy, even the guys on the board sort of know what they should be doing. But hey, you got a guy in there, and that, that I wouldn't go into my metaphor for how these guys get there. There are some very, very good at CEOs. Right, you've done a great but, job yeah, over the years explaining how those yeah, boards yeah, work. How that boards work. Yes, yes. Hey, you want to make it clear for this program or anywhere that there are very good CEOs I respect greatly. I mean, Tim Cook's a great CEO. The most important thing in the company is the CEO, by far. Uh, sets the culture and sets the leadership. And while I don't believe they should get 750 times what the, what the uh, average worker gets, I don't begrudge them that money if the stock goes way up. Yeah. Because if he gets the stock up, let him have some good money. But look what you have. You've got this, this clubby system, and, and you know what? A lot of them feel they can do what they want. Let's look at shift the facts gears here. a little bit and talk yeah. a little bit about the economy. The economic data is lackluster. Yeah. The stock market is zooming. The Federal Reserve seems like they're out of room and will likely raise rates at some point, Carl. But what's your thoughts on the way everything is? I mean, you've got 50, 60 years of investing. Well, it's not a popular thing to say, but I think it's very dangerous. You called it a casino think, earlier. You, hmm? said, you said a lot of people think that investing is like yeah, going the, to a what's, casino. But what's dangerous about it? The, right, the, now? The, the whole, right now, you're, no matter what, you're in a very, very dangerous time. A lot of people disagree with what I'm saying. Well, Some the do. Reasons why we're in hey, danger. look, this, this, this interest rate at zero, right. it's, it's not that simple just to go in and just say, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're going to make it zero interest rates, which, of course, is a great advantage to a company to borrow money at, at next to nothing. I mean, you can look at stuff. It's a great time to do a merger and acquisition. So for a while, that works and, and makes you money. But look at the results today. Earnings are down 2 3 4%. Yeah. The ad dollar is high, which costs, dollar, which, costs you a lot of, which costs you earnings. The numbers aren't coming in, in my mind, that great. But... I will tell you, you that... you see a the, correction coming? Are you hedged for a correction? Yeah, yeah, I'm really hedged. So what do you hedge? You hedge on the index Yeah, options? yeah, you're making a good point. It, it, it's, it's difficult to really do a great job hedging because we've got these long positions. And I tell you, there's ways to hedge, and this is where you do these derivatives. And it gets a little arcane, but what I really think is that's what's even more dangerous than the actual stock market is the high-yield market. In other words, the, uh, yeah. the junk bond market. It's ridiculously high for a couple of reasons. I think the fall rates are going to go up in this market. Spreads are going to widen. And, the raw, and people buy it. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. The public, the public. Well, they're chasing the yield. Well, I'm going to try to put stuff out to tell the public what they should be aware of. They're buying the yield. So you see all these high yield funds. Money keeps going into them yeah. because you, you think, oh, the bonds are going to go up. When they start coming down, right. there's going to be a great run to the exits and w what what is even worse is that even in 08 where by the way we made a lot of money doing just what i'm going to tell you i'm doing now but in 08 even you had a bit of a safety net because of the prop desks at banks today with the volcker rule yep. you yep. can't even make that investment Absolutely. so there's there's no catching it what when, when these guys and these funds get start running now. And a lot of yeah. 401k money is in these high yield bonds. I, and, and it's sad. I mean, pension, pension funds, money. high yields shouldn't be at the level they're at. The high yield market going at interest rates only 3% against treasury, uh, above treasuries. The spread, this, the, the mm -hmm. credit spread is way too narrow. So they were called high yield bonds, junk bonds yeah, for a reason. The reason. What else are you worried about, Carl? The pension funds? Yeah, but the, uh, the pension funds, they're undercapitalized, underinvested, but what if the market does really crash? I mean, people say it can't happen, and it's not going to happen. You're not going to have 08 again. I remember in 07, I was, I mean, it's very similar. It's like deja vu. I was, I was very concerned in 07. And the irony is, the irony is that in 07, just like now, people all knew the housing bubble was going to burst. But everybody was thinking, well, wait, well, well wait you remember, a year, you remember those give cliches. us six you months. Remember, there, was yeah. a, there was a city group cliche about we're going to dance until uh, music. Until yeah, we're we're gonna wait. Gonna keep wait, wait, you so can't wait. You, you can't really, wait because when the when the yeah. music stops, so, you can't just so, say so I'm so getting you, out of here so because really there's, feel, no, there's no exit. You feel a lot of similarities. You, you yeah, feel 15 is an 08? Well, I'm not going to tell you it's going to be 08. What about 16? I'm not saying it's going to be I can't predict year to year. I think anybody that does is a fool. You can't really say, I'm, you know, I'm worried about next month or even next year, but you worry about the, the system 
and what's going on. And here's a, I mean, and then you say, well, what's going to really crash it? Like, oh, wait, you know, I remember in 07, I, I again, a risk of being modest. In four days in 08, we made a billion and a half bucks for, because we put on those credit spreads and we made it on a, a couple of hundred million sure. invested because we had those credit spreads on. And I think they're right there again. Are you, are you hedging out the, the long portfolios by being short the junk market? What I do is arcane. It's an right. arcane way of doing it. But you do you it put on a derivatives. credit spread. You right. do it. You do. You buy CDS. Correct. You buy insurance in sure. a way, and it's a little complicated because it's not hard to do it, but it's very hard oh, to explain we, it. We'll be right back. We are back with the legendary investor Carl Icahn. Well, Carl, you mentioned uh, Tim Cook, so uh, you brought it up. You said Tim Cook is a good CEO, so I guess we should get that on the record. You're happy with Tim Cook right now? I think he's done the right well, thing. Well, not right now. When when we first bought it. Two years ago. 2013, you called it a no-brainer. We called it a no-brainer, no and, and no we went on Twitter and said it, and yeah. I very rarely do that. And I met Tim Cook because at that time, there were guys calling me and saying, hey, we got to get rid of this Tim Cook. Right. And I met him, and I said, this guy's great. I had dinner with him. And Steve to Jobs apartment. put him in the... I just, and you've got to learn to have a feel for guy, for, right. for people. Yep. I said, the guy's a great guy. So what was the I'm gut going, feel? And you met him. The gut the feel. You just one. meet with a guy, and after you talk to him, this, he just... He, he, the way he came out talking to me at that dinner was, this guy, he lives this, he breathes it, Heart's he's obsessed right with same it. Same way you are. Yeah, he, he, a little he bit looks, like me. Yeah. He looks at the Apple he products the same thing. way you looked at the options book right. when yeah. you were running that options book. Yeah, and, and he, he breathes it. And after you meet with him, guy said, you're not going to find a better so, guy. So the stock, yeah. uh, uh, apologize for looking down. I want to get the actual yeah. numbers right. So when you first put that tweet out, 2013, the stock is up 96% since then. And we haven't sold a share, and in fact, bought more. That's creating, on the way up. That's creating you like, a lot of shares. You share like it right value. now. You've tweeted out recently. Yeah. You like it I, right I, now. I think, listen, I can't tell you what a stock is up a lot, even though it's going at such a low multiple. It's amazing right. how low. I, I mean, how do you just the size. The, the market cap is probably hanging the multiple a little bit. A right? little bit. And, and how do you justify in the S&P? going at 18 times earnings, yeah. losing 2% in earnings, negative. These guys are talking about, I forgot, 30% increase. Yep, 200 and, billion in cash. And, 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 yeah, and, and, and it, well, if you take the cash out, it's 11 times earnings. It's absurdity. And I think it's one of the, every 50 years you get a company like this yep. that has everything going for it. It's like the old horse. I remember Secretary went in the Belmont by 30 lengths. By 30 lengths. 30 lengths. I went around and made, I, I bet in every little parlor on it, you know, two bucks, five bucks. But I, I tell you something, that, that this is like Secretary. Now, hey, can something happen? Yeah. I mean, look, this is not a, a game where you can't lose. But, and I'm not telling you Apple can't go down. 30 points either. I mean, it, it, you know, this so, has happened. Scott, you're just talking about the fundamentals that, listen, in the long-term Since 2013, it hasn't been a straight line up. But the Never been, Are right. you happy right now with the mix of, uh, of capital allocation, the buyback, the growth? Well, I'd products? always like to see bigger buybacks. Let, let me ask you about a company. When I was going back to look at Apple and when you first got involved with Apple, and you probably remember, there was a lot of criticism in the media. The media actually said, what does Carl Icahn know about technology? He'd never been successful in technology. At the Stop. same time, yeah. Uh, another great investor, a uh, legendary investor, Warren Buffett had taken this huge position in IBM, uh, a stock that at the same time period is now down close to 10%, and they have bought back huge amounts of stock. Why is it that the media will get behind something like Buffett and IBM and say that this is the greatest thing, and then they'll say when Carl gets involved and he tries to change things at Apple, you get criticized. What well, is that all about? But, but I don't believe in micromanaging a company. Right. We own 20 companies we control. We go in for the big picture. You know, in other words, we, we, we'll, if they need capital, we get right. it for them. If they want to go here, I come up with the big ideas. I am not a micromanager, nor do I think I'm a great guy in technology. But the, the difference, I think, with Apple was that a lot of people, and still do to this day, just misunderstand the company. They are so inculcated in the fact that, hey, Apple is a hardware company, right. and they don't deserve a multiple. And in fact, they're going to get tremendous competition. But it's not a hardware company. It's a company that has built this huge ecosystem. But you can't compete with Apple but, really but again, well. Uh, it gets, it gets, it gets back just, to the active and the passive um, in the sense that when you are investing in a company, you're investing in a company, the way I see it, no different than Warren Buffett. 
You're investing in a company, you're trying to generate long-term capital gains. Why is it that the media continues to look at somebody like yourself investing in a negative way? I don't think that's fair to the media. I think in so many companies, many companies that we've invested in, the media has gotten very much behind us. Okay, good. They, they, were, they were behind us in, in a number of companies saying, you ought to do something. I think in Navistar, they were behind us. Right. But I don't think Apple is a good example of media not being behind you because I think everybody, a lot of people you, read it wrong. In Apple, though, the stock went up about $14 billion right. that right. day or something, right? right? I mean, it went up a huge amount when we did it. But, you know... I don't think that's the question anymore, Gary. I don't think people say, what do we know about it? I think we're past that stage. We've done, I mean, we've made so many billions for shareholders. So right. many billions on billions on billions. And I mean, if I did a study once that all you had to do is buy the companies we went on the board of, and Correct. they're up annualized 28%. We'll be right back. We are back with Carl Icahn. So Carl, we want to play a little word association oh. game with you. Okay. So we're going to say a word and you just tell us what you think. So how about your uh, greatest fear? Greatest fear? Of, um, it's a good one. I, I, I don't think I have you a great really fear. fear. I don't that's think... That's what I uh, love about you. you I, hope, I hope that's true. I can't I think that. of one. I mean, that, that's right. the biggest lesson yeah. of the whole show. Did, did, Go ahead. Uh, Carl, describe a perfect day. This is a good one. Perfect day. <laughs> well, you take a nice walk and come to the market and you made made a great deal of money, and everybody's telling you they love you, but <laughs> it rarely happens, at least the last part. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> Maybe the first two happen, but that's after, after the market closed, a good dinner? Yeah, then have a good dinner. A good couple dinner. of martinis, Excellent. or at least, one, at least one or two martinis. Er early to bed, or you're late? No, late. late. I, I, I stay real late. It's the only piece I have, you know, after midnight. Right, it's exactly. quiet. Well, yeah, yeah. Quiet. What's your uh, motto? Do you have a motto? I, I, I have a couple of them, but I... Rather not say I'm on TV. All right, all right. How about the last question or the last word? Let's talk about legacy. I'd like to be able to do something to change this dysfunctional system we have, but I never quite get around to really putting the time into it because I'm too busy running the company. The system that we have in corporate America is it, it, it's dysfunctional because it be you have reform. no accountability. It's even worse than the political system. You can't get rid of the half these CEOs. You just can't get rid of them now. They're not all bad. I want to make it real clear. A lot of these guys are great. When, when this market does come down, which it will, I believe it, it will, maybe three, maybe three days and maybe three years. But it's going to really come down, and then you're going to need real good people running these assets, and you don't have them. So I'd like well, to change well, that. I want to personally thank you for the type of person you are and the role model that you've been to so many of us. If you want to watch a ticker, you know where to go. But if you want to know how the world ticks, watch Wall Street Week.